this time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Patient. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi review and critique show where we're putting the humanities back into science fiction. My name is Gep, and I'm joined, as always, by my friend and co-host, Dr. Izix. Co-host, Dr. Izix. Izix. How'd you do, I? See, you've met my friend and co-host, man. We're just a little brought down because when you downloaded... We thought you were a sponsoring fan. Don't get strung out by the way I sing. Don't judge a book by its vocals. I'm not much of a dragon by the light of the day. But by night I solve one hell of an equation. I'm just a sweet ion physicist from Iowa City. Iowa, ha ha. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <gasps> <laughs> I, I thought I'd get a, a a little bit didn't do uh, the the mood here for uh, for today's. Uh, yeah, anyone who didn't experience. read the title should 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 now be eminently familiar with whatever we're doing, or massively confused. <laughs> in which case, I don't know why you clicked on this. <laughs> Well, if they're massively confused, I think they're uh, 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 with the audience on this one, at least. So that works. So, yeah, um, we just finished up our run of Star Trek, the original series, completely and utterly. Gotten through two, two, two whole series and uh, a whole bunch of movies, an hour in between. And uh, so uh, I, I decided uh, to, to surprise Gepwin with a, a choice last time. And, uh, well, it... it by a mystery and uh, obfuscation, we ended up with uh, this little film here. Yeah, the uh, the cult classic, what is uh, mocking and is sci-fi. It's parody of sorts. Yeah, B-movie parody camp musical. Experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, uh, a movie that started as a stage play, actually, uh, and then uh, went to the uh, the silver screen and uh, brought with it uh, a lot of singing and tropes. And it's a it is a musical. Yeah, which I didn't I didn't realize until I was doing research for this. This is, in fact, not something that I am intimately familiar with. I have seen this movie at this point one and a half times. So and so, yes, we're, yeah. So we're going to be uh, co- covering the Rocky Horror Picture Show today. Yeah. I was waiting for you to say it because it was your pick, so it's your fault. You are to blame. I don't want people coming for me. No, 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 no. Sue's to blame. <laughs> It'll make sense, maybe. Uh, yeah. So uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's a cult classic. Uh, it is presently, I believe, the longest uh, running theatrical release ever because it has been having weekly showings. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how, how if if that's changed during COVID here, but. You know, for for at least a number of decades, and like no other movie's done that, so you know, just fun. And it all was happening like right around where I live in New York, without me knowing for a long time. I mean, I was vaguely aware, of course. I think anyone's at least vaguely aware of Rocky Horror and the whole legacy and and cult following around it, but. Having never interacted with it, I didn't have friends who did this. I've never gone to an actual showing of this so I've, I've had the passive cultural familiarity and that's about it yeah i've not been to a showing uh, for a while yet but uh you know my first one was uh early 2000s in the uh in the des moines area so uh you know i'm originally from iowa hence the the iowa city bit there uh, <laughs> that's where i got my undergrad degree anyway <laughs> Uh, so the uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show is uh, it's it is a, f- a bit of a phenomenon, and uh, you can probably go into this a little bit more, uh, you know, after uh, the synopsis there. But it is something that has generated a whole sort of culture around it. Uh, that there's the shadow cast, there's you know uh, callbacks, there's uh, props to be brought in for the experience. And uh, for uh, for Gepwin here, I have to ask him two important questions. What is your favorite color? Uh, general, well, 
I guess kind of a gold now. It used to be yellow. <laughs> <sighs> All right, and the, the second question is, uh, where do you get your drugs? <laughs> right now, I bum them off of any friend that's happening to hand them out. <laughs> So, uh, for those who are familiar with the, the sort of the culture of Rocky Horror, or, uh, Gebwin has identified himself uh, as a virgin. So, uh, so uh, hopefully we'll uh, help him with that uh, as we go forward. This but, is a way uh, you get your shoelaces yeah, a little question, slack here. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Did your girlfriend smoke weed? But no, uh, this is a uh, uh, the the, the, the uh, for. Uh, to a little spoilers here. The uh, the answers to the questions is Magenta and Columbia. Oh, makes sense. Uh, yes, but uh, yeah, we should probably talk a little bit about the uh, the cast here. And uh, you know, it was uh, originally uh, written by one of the actors, uh, Richard O'Brien, who uh, you know uh, worked on the screenplay with someone named uh, uh, Jim Sherman. And uh, we've run into Richard O'Brien uh, before. Yeah, I've, I'd had forgotten until I was looking back at this. We had had him in dark city we've got several mm -hmm. return actors in this one so uh we got we got uh, also uh the, the the impossible tim curry who's uh playing dr frankenfurter a scientist who has uh been in uh, a number of things uh including uh clue which is probably one of his, his yeah, i guess his most famous role other than this so <laughs> also the command and conquer video games that's always yes, just fun. Uh, they aren't a movie but <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know uh are we going to space today uh Gepwin? you know the only place untouched by uh capitalism <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite performances as a child was uh muppet treasure island oh yeah yeah but yeah, yeah, yeah. he's been in some really good stuff and he's kind of an amazing actor uh and yeah he do, he's done voice work as well he's uh shown up in a lot of random ass things uh and uh yes we will be saying uh a bit more risque words though this time because it's kind of you know necessary i'm just looking through his whole listing here and yeah it's i i can't even go through it all because it's just so long but uh <laughs> uh yeah he's been in some stuff so uh Moving on, <laughs> well, we got ourselves, uh, you know, the uh, our uh, hero and heroine. Uh, the our, our heroine is Janet Wise, played by Susan Sarandon, uh, who is, um, you know, also a, a I guess one one of those uh, Hollywood actors that's been around a lot. We previously encountered her hey. in Cloud Atlas, but yeah, she's been in in almost everything. In fact, she's been following me around yes, this week. Uh, There's been like a radio a radio special that's played twice that's had her in it. And we're like, why Why is Susan Sarandon everywhere? Susan Sarandon, stop stalking <laughs> Gepwood. <laughs> yeah, she's uh, been in lots of uh, movies, uh, this way, that way. Um, she also has a, a bit of controversy around her, uh, you know, because uh, you know, she's very politically active uh, and, uh, you know, is, you know supported the Green Party and that sort of thing so on occasion and, well, I have my own thoughts mm. about the Green Party, but we'll we'll just sort of mention that. Uh, there's uh, uh, Brad Majors, who is uh, played by Barry Bostwick, uh, whose name I always forget when I look up stuff. <laughs> over here. But, uh, you know, he's been in a number of things as well. Uh, MAGA Force. <laughs> I know him best as the mayor in Spin City. Oh, yeah. He was in uh, something called Slither. From 1974. Yeah, Spin City, uh, Law and Order. He's in a number of uh, episodes there as Oliver Gates. Uh, there's uh, apparently he was uh, also Franklin Delano Roosevelt in FDR, American Badass. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the one where he has the uh, machine gun wheelchair. And uh, yeah, he's played, you know, various uh, character roles in. Uh, movies and tv shows uh, of course richard o'brien who you've already mentioned uh who was in dark city you know Ar urban gothic apparently in something called the dick francis thriller the racing game it's a cowboy uh he's in flash gordon i did not know that richard o'brien is alive <laughs> uh there's a uh, as playing magenta is patricia quinn uh who's uh you know, you know a little shorter on the uh, uh the the uh, the cast listing here for various uh, roles but you know she's been in various things uh you know movies tv as well uh, she was in i claudius i've heard of that i can not remember what that was it's about uh claudius the uh that roman emperor yeah. fella. <laughs> it's, uh, also in the meaning of life also doctor who apparently oh. 
and dragonfire. Yeah, she's been around. She's she was being interviewed on something yeah. recently. She was fun. There's a uh, Columbia uh, as a groupie uh, who is in several things Rocky Horror related, of course. <laughs> uh you know a few roles uh not as many as uh you know she was in uh, pink floyd's the wall also as a groupie uh she was also in uh, a little thing called uh shock treatment mildly heard of that yes it's actually technically the sequel to rocky Horror, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but she's playing a different character so yeah <laughs> there is uh jonathan adams is a uh, dr everett scott a rival scientist you know, a number of other things as well. Uh, um, just kind of looking through, trying to find anything that I recognize here. Um, Eskimo Nell. Now, over here at that. Hey, who's Z Cars? <laughs> <laughs> it's back, baby. <laughs> uh, there was uh, Patricia Hinwood, who is a. Uh, 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 sorry, not P Patricia. Peter Hinwood, who plays Rocky Horror, a creation, who was only in a few things here, um, like. A, Odyssea, uh, Hamlin, Rocky Horror, and Sebastian, and, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> then he retired. Uh, I, I think he runs a shop now or something like that. There is, uh, you know, Charles Gray as the criminologist who is an expert, uh, who is a uh, bit more of the uh, you know extensive uh, experiences acting. Uh, Sword of Freedom, the Desperate Man, uh, Armchair Theater, Masquerade, the Upper Crusts. Uh, thriller, not Michael Jackson. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, Hazel uh, Shock Treatment also uh, is uh, the judge apparently, uh, and various other things. Uh, the Gourmet, uh, Power Porter House Blue, Black Eyes, and so on and so forth. You could. He was a Bond villain, wasn't he? Diamonds are forever. Yes, he was actually. It was Blofeld. Hey, Blofeld, what's up? So one of those guys that you recognize, but you don't know why. At least from my generation. Yes. I'm sure if you were from <laughs> a slightly of... older generation, you've seen him in things. Yeah, it's like, it's that guy. Pops up occasionally. And finally, playing Eddie, an ex-delivery boy, a very ex-delivery boy, is Meatloaf. So, uh, do you know about Meatloaf? I do know Step about one? Meatloaf. Yes. He should stay away from those motorcycles. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. He's a bit of a, a, a musician of some sort, you know. Uh, a, a lot of his uh, credits are actually, you know... Meatloaf music videos, so... Yeah, uh, well, I think he was also in the Blood Rain movies and a couple other things of that level. Ghost Wars, apparently, is uh, most recently, so... I keep forgetting that he also has an acting career. Uh, just not super common. Um, he was in uh, Tenacious D in The Pick of Destiny. Makes sense. <laughs> yes, uh, Blood Rain, as you mentioned. Uh, Fight Club as... Uh, the video game is Bob's voice. Fun. <laughs> Uh, Couldn't get I, I Bob. Think that's, <laughs> so uh, that's most of our uh, cast here. There's a few other characters and a bunch of folks that are just uh, identified as uh, uh, Transylvanians. Um, so yeah, that's uh, most of our cast list here. Yeah, it's a weird mix of people who have done one or two things and people who went on to be some of the most famous people in their field. Yes. <laughs> to a varying degree, uh, some of them have complicated relationships with this movie others are like yeah it was really fun and you know i look back at it as sort of a rite of passage uh sort of experience and uh and some of them were uh you know for the original stage play like patricia Quinn, uh quinn um and uh some of them were from you know other stage play productions like meatloaf he was in the los angeles production uh and they were brought in to uh you know to you know play you know reprise their roles for the film and then you know like oh they're actually pretty decent actors. Let's like put them in other stuff. I know Tim Curry got tired of talking about it and has also been kicked out of a couple of showings. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, one of my friends been technically kicked out of what, uh, a showing of Rocky Horror. Um, that's because he, uh, he was uh, callbacks that were heavy on the abortion uh, <laughs> in the middle of Indiana. So, you know. <laughs> OK, yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> so shall we uh, get to the uh, synopsis here? May as well. Yeah. All right, so uh, so for our audiences here, uh, part of the uh, tradition of Rocky Horror is callbacks. So I've actually provided my uh, script here uh, to, uh, to to Gepwin, and Gepwin, feel free to, of course, you know, you know, input as you need, uh, you know, as uh, far as regular commentary as well. Uh, so uh, you know, just have fun and let's go with the flow. So uh, Gepwin, mind kicking us, kicking us off here. A 
long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, God said, let there be lips, and said, sing, lips, sing. Exactly. The opening credits is a pair of singing lips. The tune is science fiction double feature. A tune that references all sorts of old sci-fi and B-movies. Freeze those lips. The cast are introduced with the names of their characters and archetypes. Freeze those teeth. And also we gotta ask, who's to blame for this nonsense? Sue's to blame. Eventually we find ourselves raising a church at the end of a wedding. There's the happy couple and lots of interesting characters about, including an odd trio in back. Anyway, we have Brad and Janet, our protagonists for the movie. Janet catches the bouquet, and the groom suggests it might be Brad's turn next for this whole marriage thing. But Brad is more concerned about the smell of his finger. The couple drives off, and Janet comments about Betty being just that morning plain old Betty Monroe. Now she's just plain and old. Brad leads Janet into the graveyard, teasing something. As we start in the tune, Damn It, Janet, we hear distant thunder, suggesting a storm is coming. After defacing the church door, Brad pulls out a ring to propose. Janet accepts with much fumbling with the ring. They head inside the church as two blank-faced folks switch things over for a funeral. After a kiss, we introduce the criminologist. He'll pop in from time to time throughout the movie to offer exposition and to increase the suspense badly. He asks us if he may... He may. ...take us on a strange journey through a terrible movie. He pulls out a large book. He wants to show us his Pokemons. The book has photos and statements. It tells us that Brad and Janet left the town of Denton to visit a Dr. Everett Scott, their ex-tutor. So back with the couple, they're driving down the road, listening to the Nixon show. They're passed by motorcycles heading the opposite direction. Brad's not impressed by folks who ride, in, ride bikes in a the storm. They then run into a dead end, which begs the question, where did those motor motorcycles come from? Trying to pull back, they pop a tire. Brad mentions they passed a castle a ways back. Janet insists on going along with, just in case there's a beautiful woman in there. So they get out of the car and into the rain. Brad inspects the pop tire. Only rubber in the movie and it's got a hole in it. They head to the castle. Ignoring the entry at your own risk side, they start to sing, they start into a new song, over at the Frankenstein place. With Janet under the newspaper failing to remain dry, they notice there's a light in the castle, you know, over at the Frankenstein place. There's a light. Where's our democracy? Burning in the fireplace. Some cyclists pull up as Riff Raff sings a verse. We cut back to the criminologist who says, oh, things were looking good, but were they? Back with a the couple, they ring the bell, and it's answered by Riff Raff, a balding fellow with a hump, who says, hello. Brad is a huge dork as he asks for help in a phone. Riff Raff is weird at them and invites them in, explaining that tonight is a special night, one of the master's affairs. But which one? The interior is kind of creepy. Magenta, in a maid outfit, declares everybody lucky. Just like the banister. The clock strikes, and it's astounding. Time is fleeting. Madness takes its toll. But listen closely. For how long? Not for very much longer. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, let's do the time warp. Perhaps the most famous tune from the film. Magenta and Riff Raff chase Brad and Janet in the party room, where there's a bunch of oddly dressed guests. The criminologist helps us learn how to do the time warp. We are also introduced to Columbia, decked out in the sequined outfit and tap shoes, which she makes good use of. Brad and Janet start to be back out to the door. After the song, all the guests collapse. Time for Brad to be awkward again. Indeed. He asks us for the, you know, he asks for the way to Madison. Janet, just like, hey, let's get out of here, please. Come on. The guests get up as someone comes down the elevator behind them. Brad and Janet turn and notice Frank and Furter. We'll just call them Frankie. Frankie starts up the next tune, Sweet Transvestite. Turns out that Frankie, Frankie is a sweet transvestite from Transsexual Transylvania. As they cast off their cape to reveal the iconic outfit of the film, complete with corset and high heels. Brad tries to ask to use the phone. Frankie seems to have other plans, though. Maybe a satanic mechanic. Maybe to stay for the night. A bite. He's been 
make it a man you see Riffraff's not much of a man, though. Uh, not him. Uh, uh, Frankie invites them up to the lab with much teasing to draw out our Antissa... Say it. Patient. Riffraff and Magenta start getting Brad and Janet out of their so close. Uh, Brad promises to pull out the aces when the time is right, just as his pants are being pulled down. Like those aces? Brad keeps trying to introduce himself. Soon the couple are down to their undies. Riffraff drops a bottle of wine. I'll catch it. Oops. And they head upstairs to the lab. It is very pink and red, with something under a tarp. A machine under the balcony, the guests, the Transylvanians, on the balcony, and a statue-based sound system. Those are some well-hung speakers. Frankie, in a lab coat, is super friendly, gets them robes, offers up some quality... Horse brutality. Uh, uh, hospitality. Brad becomes super asshole as he points out that they only wanted to use the phone. Frankly compliments him for being so dominant. Janet's a bit more giggly. Then Frankie gets Frankie gets to the main presentation, explaining how they made their breakthrough to discover the spark of life. The tarp is removed, revealing a suspended body in bandages, and we begin the lengthy mad science scene. Takes time to turn up the reactor three more triangles. One application of food coloring and evil laughter later, the creature arises. Oh, Rocky. This is Rocky, and he doesn't speak much, but does want to sing, specifically the tune Sword of Damocles. It's a tune where Rocky tries to sort out the whole existential crisis of existing as being all, woe is me. No, Rocky, it's him. Frankie is abusive to Riff Raff and gawks at Rocky as his bandages are removed, leaving Rocky in gold undies and showing off his many, many muscles. But soon Frankie is chasing after Rocky, who doesn't seem that interested in Frankie. After the song, Frankie expresses displeasure, but forgives Rocky. Riff Raff Magenta sing Frankie's praises. Columbia calls Rocky just okay. Oops, somebody screwed up. This pisses off Frankie, who tries to get Brad and Janet's input. But Janet likes, is just like, I don't like guys with too many muscles. Frankie's indignant, because he didn't make Rocky for her. And so, time for another song. I could make you a man. Be a man. No, that's a that's a different mus musical there. Um, uh, Frankie just wants to explain how Rocky's going to be strong and work out. Turns out that in just seven days... And six long nights. Frankie can make you a man. But the tune is interrupted by the deep freezer opening up. And behold, a meatloaf. Uh, I mean, Eddie. He has an important question. Whatever happened to Saturday night? It turned into Sunday morning. Which opens up the next song, Hot Patootie. This features Eddie driving his motorcycle in the middle of the lab and dancing at the Columbia. He has a big cut on his forehead and looks like he's been chilling out for a while. Frankie gets angry as Rocky starts to dance along. So Rocky gets tossed in the elevator as Eddie starts to drive around the lab causing havoc. Frankie gets a pick and is soon chasing Eddie back into the freezer. Soon, there's a trail of red... Frankie's gloves are covered in blood, and Eddie is silent. Frankie lets out Rocky and explains that it was a mercy killing before going into a reprisal of I'll Make You a Man. Don't forget to kick yourself in the rump as you sing, folks. Janet is now cool with muscles, and also time for Frankie to take Rocky to the wedding bed. Is life just an illusion? The criminologist says some folks say so. But he's actually here to explain that the guests had all left, and Brad and Janet had been sent to their separate rooms. Janet and Riff Raff spy on Janet to establish that there's a secret camera watching the guest rooms. Later, Janet is roused by a knocking. It seems Brad has come for her. Soon they're making out. Janet is concerned, but then she pulls off Frankie's wig. She's angry at first. But soon, after some banter, Frankie promises not to tell Brad. So they get busy. Back with Magenta and Riff Raff. It's a hard not life for us. They're lazily cleaning up the lab. But soon, they're eyeing Rocky, who's sleeping in the bridal bed. Riff Raff, looking for entertainment, threatens him with a candelabra. Rocky, in good monster, mo monster movie style, freaks out and eventually breaks free, running off and outside. Meanwhile, Magenta and Riff Raff have some good elbow sex. Cheating scene, take two. Meanwhile, in Brad's room... He hears Janet's voice and soon is joined by, oh, it's just Frankie again. There's a strong parallel to the previous bit with Janet, with the two spouting almost the same lines, right on down to the blame line. But Sue's to blame. 
After a promise not to tell Janet and an interruption from Riff Raff, Frankie gets to work, work on Brad. Elsewhere, Janet's having a bad time and Rocky's being chased by the hounds. Janet goes looking for Brad as she feels guilty about getting busy with Frank. She returns to the lab and uses the secret camera monitor to spot Brad having a post-coital smoke with Frankie looking satisfied. She then spots Rocky hiding under the tarp. Rocky looks hurt. She tears a part of her skirt for a bandage. Heh, <laughs> Susan Saran rap. The criminologist breaks in to talk about emotions and how Janet was a slave to hers. This kicks off Touch a Touch a Touch Me. Seems Janet, having now had sex, wants more. And well, Rocky is right there. Magenta and Columbia enjoy the show as they get busy. Does someone hear a whip? Yes, actually. As Frankie is punishing Riff Raff for letting Rocky go. Arriving with Brad in the elevator to the lab, Riff Raff lies about what happened and, the, and then points out that they have a visitor. It's Dr. Scott! Riff Raff asks Brad if he knows this earthling. Frankie's, you know, threat has him correct to person. Brad explains they're old friends. Frankie explains that Dr. Scott investigates UFOs and seems angry about that. And that Brad is his associate. Clearly this was all planned to sneak in and get intel on the castle. Dr. Scott enters the building. Which room will he be in? The eight room? The nine room? The zen room! Frankie uses a big magnet, which pulls the wheelchair bounds Dr. Scott around the house and upstairs, in visiting Magenta and Columbia on the way. Ring around the lesbians. One Kool-Aid man moment later, Dr. Scott arrives. Frankie continues to suggest a conspiracy, but Dr. Scott is here for Eddie. Frankie is surprised. Eddie is Scott's nephew! Dun dun dun! Also, Rocky and Janet are discovered, causing an amusing character sound off. Dr. Scott... Janet, Brad, Rocky, Bullwinkle. Magenta breaks the tension both with Big Gong because dinner is ready. The criminologist talks about food being an important ritual. At the table, Riff Raff drops a huge chunk of meat onto the table. Frankie gets to cutting slices. Frankie makes a toast to absent friends and to Rocky. Birthday hat and a little happy birthday singing later. They get eating. Scott brings up Eddie again. Frankie points out how that's a tender subject another slice anyone brad gets it janet gets it dr scott gets it columbia really gets it Rocky doesn't care dr scott breaks the fourth wall for a moment to start talking about eddie being in with a bad crowd aliens frankie's like oh yeah dr vaughn scott wait a tick is dr scott a nazi scott starts singing the tune is eddie and it's about how much of a bad kid eddie was Columbia's verse, though, was about how she was keen on him. Seems Eddie left Scott a note about evil deeds. Then Frankie pulls away the tablecloth, revealing Eddie's corpse! <gasps> Janet runs into Rocky's arms, pissing off Frankie again, who gets real mean, chasing Janet into the next song. Planet, Schmanet, Janet. Starting to think Frankenfurter might be the villain here. Janet is chased up to the lab, where Brad and Dr. Scott arrive via elevator. But then Frankie uses the machinery to glue the trio to the floor. And we find out that Frankie might send them to another planet, maybe? Frankie taunts the trio one at a time as Janet uses the Medusa device to turn Brad, Dr. Scott, and Janet into statues. But also Columbia and Rocky. But not before Columbia complains about how Frankie be is being awful to people. Chewing them up and spitting them out. Frankie laments all that's happened and asks if it was wrong to split Eddie's brain between him and Rocky. Magenta is, however, tired of this world and wants to return to Transylvania. Frankie's dismissive, mentions the floor show, before leaving Riff Raff Magenta to get up to more elbow sex. So this criminologist, where's his neck? He has no neck! But he is also confused about this floor show thing. Lots of mystery there. Ah, but will there be a picnic? No picnic. Anyway, next song is up. Rose Tinge My World. Frankie preps the statues and outfits and makeup similar to their, uh, what they tend to sport. One by one, they are destatued to sing about their recent experiences and how they've changed because of them. This soon shifts into fanfare, don't dream it, with Frankie leading the song off in front of the Archaea logo. We learn a little bit about what kicked off Frankie's interest in being a transdustite before Frankie hops to the pool, singing Don't Dream It, Be It. Frankie is soon joined by the others. 
Last one of the pool has to be in the sequel. The five enjoy themselves as Dr. Scott gets unfrozen. Scott complains about decadence, but even Scott's having trouble resisting the call of the sensual. Suddenly... Whose house is this? Mine, says Frankie, kicking off Wild and Untamed Thing, a tune that brings up the rose-tinted world motif, motif again. There's a lot of high-kick dancing, but then Riff Raff Magenta show up, looking like Spanx cadets. Raff Raff declares himself the new commander. Frankie's now his prisoner, the returned Transylvania. Magenta, get the car. Frankie tries to defuse the situation by a song. Columbia gets the lights. She learned that on the way to 1,000 YouTube subscribers. And Rocky plays with electrical box. And him by the time he hit 100,000. I'm Going Home is our next song. Seems Frankie has seen some blue skies through the tears and is thinking about some heavy stuff. Magenta is, on the other hand, visibly bored as Frankie starts imagining a whole audience. But the moment is ruined as Magenta speaks up. Seems the two of them are going home. Frankenfurter is not. Seems Riff Raff has a laser that projects a beam of pure antimatter. How does that work? It doesn't matter. There's some banter before Frankie stands up. Columbia screams and gets zapped. Frankie tries to climb the curtain away, but gets zapped to death. Rocky angry. Rocky pick up Frankie's body and gets zapped. Chest of steel. Multiple times. Shoulder of steel. But eventually falls as well into the pool. Magenta points out uh, that they liked Riff Raff. Riff Raff's like, they never liked me. Dr. Scott's like, we're cool, right? Uh, we good? Riff Raff's like, yeah, and you should leave. We're going back to Transsexual in the Galaxy of Transylvania. And we're taking the whole house. Rad, Janet, and Dr. Scott make an exit. We get a little time warp reprisal to get excited with because it's... House launching day. And in some versions of the film, we have one more song, Superheroes. A short song where Brad and Janet seek each other out in the fog. Also, Dr. Scott is there in the center of the world, spinning world, as we cut back to the criminologist for one more verse about being lost. The end! Well, that's just fun. I think that's the most concise synopsis we've ever done. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think it's been it, it's helped that uh, there's so much of the movie that is singing. And so you can kind of just sum it up real quick like there. So Yeah, you can definitely not have to summarize the songs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to touch on the uh, the themes perhaps a little bit. and uh, But really, this is a movie that's best experienced, not necessarily described. So Yeah, I still feel like it's fun. It's fun getting to do the counterpoint dialogue. And I feel like I kind of missed out a little bit, never having gotten to actually see it with a group since I've only ever seen it like once by myself and once with my partner. So uh, perhaps this is a, a good reason for yourself to uh, seek out a, a, a viewing uh, when it's you know safe and you're comfortable. With yeah, in another year out. when everything is <laughs> calmed down a little. Yeah, fingers crossed there. And uh, we're through whatever variants we got here on the COVIDs and all that, of course. But uh, yeah, so... Uh, it is a bit of an experience, and you know, you get when maybe you now have a l at least a little bit of insight of some of the callbacks. You know, if you want to, you yourself or our listeners want to go to a showing, uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, locations have uh, on websites and things like that actual callback lists that they are uh, you know commonly use at their locations. So you can actually do a bit of research in order to uh, get a little leg up, or you could go in cold and just experience it for yourself without any sort of, you know, uh, uh, preconceptions about what to expect. But it's like uh, a verse book. Yeah, <laughs> there's a uh, multiple ways to sort of experience it for the first time, and uh, and if you enjoy it, uh, you know, you could always head back. So, uh, Gap, did you would would you say that you uh, you know uh, enjoyed this movie or simply tolerated it? I, I really enjoyed it. I will say I enjoyed the first half a bit more. It, it I like I I understand it's kind of an absurdist camp B movie plot, but it really didn't feel like they had any any particular conception of how they were going to end this movie. Yes, <laughs> it's like all right, well we kind of touched upon some of the stuff we wanted to touch upon, and now we should probably like resolve the plot, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and then then they're aliens, and then <laughs> and the, and there's there's some more singing and some uh, dancing and uh, a pool and. Um, and then the house leaves. <laughs> I did enjoy all of like the sci-fi Frankenstein stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Like took me a minute to. I'm gonna have to watch this again and like follow the pitchfork imagery throughout. So there's a lot of pitchforks mm-hmm. in this movie, and then Riff Raff showing up with a pitchfork shaped laser gun yes. to <laughs> to echo the end of the Frankenstein movies is is just awesome. It is, you know, it's like, I'm going to be, uh, you know, coming after you, Rocky, with this uh, sci-fi pitchfork. Yeah, there's just so many little things like that that just kind of makes this movie kind of awesome. Uh, you know, there's you know, the pitchfork stuff. There's all the references to various uh, old, uh, you know, and you know, some of them still existing uh, uh, film companies that produce a lot of B-movies. Just some of the aesthetics is just perfect it's like yes we have this big machine that just does stuff and it has levers and you just turn something and it does all sorts of things that you want it to and it doesn't really matter that there's no actual controls to it we just know (laughs) that this is a a big switch that does a thing and that was kind of common in a lot of b-movies so (laughs) well i was thinking about this before it's amazing as a as a b-movie parody it's an intentionally campy movie, which is a really interesting concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, a very long discussion about the other day um, on to what is and isn't campy and how one can be intentionally versus unintentionally campy, which I found some interesting articles about. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that uh, like this is intentionally campy and pulls it off well. Uh, like the Flash Gordon movie is, is kind of super sincere and that makes it the campiness it you know very potent (laughs) and so it's very and so there's like different sort of ways you can sort of approach making something campy and then you also got instances where it just kind of happens when it's not intentional well we're gonna have to get into this part of the discussion eventually and this is a good segue as any because i did find some a few articles uh there's there's been quite a few very very famous breakdowns of camp as a genre because it's a weird phenomenon Mm -hmm. Um, I should have brought up the article that had all of my references in it or written those down, but, uh, you know, I forget to do that. So I'm not going to be referencing authors for some reason. (laughs) Yeah, that's a problem. Anyway, uh, there seems to me at least some debate over whether camp is a thing that can basically exist by itself, like a emergent phenomenon in movies that are, you know, badly made, but sincere enough to be interesting or ironically uh, stylized and that kind of argument goes with the idea that um, modern society especially but just kind of generally society and life is at least some level performed and by calling out and exaggerating that performance you wind up with something that is very campy because it's an exaggeration of the performance that you already do, which you can look at in something like drag, which is a very exaggerated version of what women are supposed to do to perform femininity. Uh, the Some of the other writings on this uh, call out that viewpoint for kind of removing camp as a decidedly queer phenomenon, and that the idea of camp basically came out of the queer community, and therefore... Um, queer people kind of have exclusive rights to declare something as camp. And something is not camp until the queer community has reached a general consensus that it is. Sort of a, uh, you know, a, a declarative uh, statement that isn't quite declared, I guess. <laughs> yeah, like it's, it's a general consensus thing. But also that it's very specific to the lgbt community and that that is where it comes from and they are the only ones who get to decide what it is i guess you know there is maybe some wisdom in both ends of this here that you know as you know the the lgbt community as a you know for for the longest time a portion of our society that has been kind of on the outs with the majority of the society it's well positioned in order to recognize the over the top uh, you know what what is performative about our you know things in our society, and then to notice more specifically when those are being you know pushed to over the top sort of levels, uh, or you know you know uh, done in such a way that it's kind of charming as opposed to just sort of the same old. And it's also an interesting one when you're looking at kind of camp as exaggerated, stylized performance. It's kind of like just taking it's taking what's already there and then exaggerating it just enough to become funny or Mm -hmm. ironic and uh i've weirdly coincidentally been reading several things 
uh, in the gender studies sort of vein, uh, talking about non-binary trans and, and uh, other LGBT topics, uh, talking about gender very specifically. And a lot of people uh, call out gender as something that is very performed. And especially if you are someone who feels like they exist outside of our heteronormative binary gender system, it's very easy to see as a performative element. And that is something that I feel like the queer community generally uh, sees and where you get the campiness. It's like they, you can already see that it's a performance where other people might feel it's more natural. So mm -hmm. seeing it as a performance, it's very easy to look at something campy and go, well, that is an exaggerated version of this performance. And that's interesting. Folks might have uh, heard the term that, uh, you know, gender is a social contract, a uh, construct here. And so, you know, that's mm -hmm. sort of, I guess, the next level that if it's a, uh, a construct, then performing one's gender is very much performance. And so, you know, it's. Yeah, so if you already sort of have that as a you know a background sort of thought there, it's you know very easy to sort of you know view things in that lens. Well, I'm going I'm going to badly summarize this, so please look up the original. But uh, um, Judith Butler, who wrote kind of the seminal work on works on gender in modern mm -hmm. history, uh, it has described it as sort of a it's a construct that is made by both the performance and the agreement of that performance. Mm -hmm. So it's not exactly like a script or something that you have to follow. It is itself created by everyone doing it. So yeah, yeah. when someone acts in a masculine way and other people go, yes, that's a masculine performance, and then also do that, the act of everyone doing that and you doing it specifically is what makes it the thing itself. If uh, everyone agrees that, you know, lifting heavy objects is a uh, masculine uh, thing, then that becomes a masculine thing. Except that it kind of goes both directions. Like someone lifts a heavy object, says, oh, look how masculine I am, in, you know, the simplest form. And other people go, yes, that dude is masculine for lifting a heavy thing. But, you, know, you can also have uh, instances where, you know, something in one uh, culture or community, you know, is seen as masculine, but not, uh, the, you know, so in another community. It's just sort of a, well, you just did a thing. Uh, cool. Yeah. Different cultures, different times, things like that. You can get some variations of that. And, uh, you know, that sometimes leads to weird cultural interactions as well. And so, you know, that we could go into a whole discussion there about colonialism at some point, but maybe we'll save that for later. <laughs> Yeah, colonialism really, really screwed everything over. Yes. In fact, colonialism and the spread of uh, Christianity through colonialist missionaries is why so much of the world is suddenly uh, homophobic in the you know seventeen and eighteen hundreds. Like before and, that, uh, most non most non Western cultures just just it was generally accepted. It was just a thing that happened. Yeah, and then like, the spread of Christianity kind of demonized it all over. And uh, that's kind of ongoing as well. Uh, you know, folks, you know, probably heard about Christian missionary groups uh, and various and, and related, you know, pushing highly anti uh, LGBT laws in various countries, you know, most most commonly in Africa, uh, you know, where, you know, it's like before there's just no laws on on this sort of thing. Uh, and then suddenly, oh, death penalty. Uh, there's suddenly a bunch of money to support that. That's kind of terrible. Yeah, because colonialism didn't screw up Africa enough. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a, a, a fellow I know uh, from Madagascar who's, uh, you know, talked a bit about that. Uh, and that it's sort of really annoying because this becoming sort of the, you know, hot button issue uh, kind of means that suddenly things that are actually important are not being taken care of because this is suddenly, you know, you know, the, we have to be super bigoted is suddenly the thing that's, you know, what people are calling for because of the, uh, you know, uh, money being put in to advertise this sort of way of thinking. And it kind of sucks. Yeah. Did you think we could bring colonialism into Rocky Horror? <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Maybe we should uh, go to a different avenue <laughs> real quick. <laughs> I was enjoying that this film very much going off of the Frankenstein as a B-movie concept. Um, well, I was, I keep having this debate internally. You made this decision, so I didn't have to be a part of it. But I keep having this internal debate over what I should bring into the bounds of science fiction as far as things that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And the fact that this was 
parodying slash homaging the very core of science fiction kind of tipped it over for me in a way that I didn't know it was doing quite like obviously Frankenfurter and Rocky and the the whole Frankenstein thing they're doing there but they really brought it all the way through mm -hmm. and it's it I thought it was kind of an interesting one that um they more or less flipped it from the original story both uh bringing it seeing it through the lens of the movie which already kind of uh it didn't flip it from the original story but it took out a lot of elements from the original story and then yeah. taking it one step further in this they have now completely flipped the the original story and the the, the main sort of uh, elements of that because in the original while frankenstein's creation was monstrous he was incredibly intelligent mm -hmm. and that is where you kind of got the juxtaposition there of he's being rejected by his creator because he's not as beautiful as he wants him to be but he's also incredibly intelligent he's the intellectual superior in a lot of ways and he becomes incredibly well read and educated throughout the course of the book then of course the original you know monster movie made frankenstein's creation sort of ugly and dumb yeah it's more like a zombie really yeah and then you took that around into here where they kept the kind of personality of the you know monster from the b movie but then made him incredibly archetypically attractive yeah, so, so uh, you switched it around from monstrous but intelligent to stupid and beautiful instead of uh, you know in the original uh, frankenstein you know the you know frank you know, dr frankenstein rejecting his creation upon its uh, arrival into the world you know, uh, Frank Inverter is all about, hmm, I really like what I see. Yeah, in a lot of ways, his creation rejects him more so yes. than he rejects his creation. Yeah, because, uh, you know, Rocky's, you know, constantly uh, finding interest in other people. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, no, Janet is in his arms. This is, this will not do. Now, that's probably a good segue to talk about what everyone talks about with this movie, which is the... High heels? Yes. <laughs> there's there's a very obvious and what's always talked about is the sort of uh i don't exactly know how to put it because i haven't heard anyone describe it exactly but kind of the queer discovery element to the movie where you're yes. starting with the supposed straight couple they enter a new unknown world full of odd people and they are exposed to a lot of new experiences and then at the end, come out as completely different people. Yes, uh, it is, you know, a, a bit of a, you know, a, you know, a bit of exposure, uh, a bit of activity, a bit of, you know, seeing, you know, a world beyond their, you know, their normal experiences, and suddenly they realize, oh, I am much more than what I thought I was. And I thought it was kind of interesting because I'd seen the beginning of this before. This is the first time that I've watched it all the way through. But I've mm -hmm. seen like the first half before and I didn't remember. And it was kind of interesting seeing it now with more with more cultural context than I had the first time I watched that part of it. Seeing just kind of how awkward and weird Brad and Janet seem at the seem at the beginning in the wedding scene. Because mm -hmm. Brad yep. is Brad doesn't know how to react to his now married friend at all and neither of them seems super comfortable with like he definitely doesn't seem very comfortable with the wedding idea janet seems excited about it but in a hard to read way yeah it's sort of like uh, you know i'm supposed to be excited about this so i am in a way yeah and you get a lot of death imagery in that yes. part of the movie <laughs> yeah there, there's that you know kind of old joke that uh, you know a wedding and a funeral are kind of the you know the same thing in a way yeah so I think what, what I found very interesting, and this is a bringing in some personal stuff that I've been like talking about vaguely elsewhere on the internet, but not very much here. Um, partway through lockdown, I kind of started coming to terms with the fact that while I have identified as straight for most of my life, I am actually a lot more comfortable thinking of myself as bisexual. And that part of the movie was really resonating for me on that level. Because even identifying myself straight, looking back on my rest of my life, 
I realize how much I didn't really fit in in a way that I was supposed to and didn't exactly realize why that was until I was able to come to terms with this. Yeah, suddenly a realization is like, oh, now everything makes sense. huh? Yeah, before I was just like awkward and got into trouble all the time and didn't know why I didn't fit in very well with like straight culture, other boys, like all the people that I was supposed to get along with very well. Now it's like, well, it's because the world as presented to me is not really one that is for me. And I didn't realize that. You know, you've been told that it is for you, but for some reason, just not clicking. Yeah. And you wind up with all these stupid things. I'm sorry. I'm going to go on a very mild rant here. Cause... Go ahead. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I would probably do uh, the same if I was, you know, the same position. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I guess I'm also bi, so, but I, I guess I've kind of had this process happened a while back now so go ahead <laughs> well i'm actually kind of curious if you had the same experience like also coming from that side of things is one of the things that i realized made it so hard to, to to realize this for myself is all the times i have heard someone say something along the lines of i know it is normal for a straight man to be attracted to other men like it's a constant refrain that i hear over and over, and I have no idea why. It's very weird to me. <laughs> it's like being bi or, or gay is also being straight. Yeah. How, how does that work? <laughs> I don't know. I also read an article very recently about how we should let straight men have same-sex relationships and like not, well, okay, not have but, that change yeah. their straightness. <laughs> uh i i think the uh the terms is uh you know if the balls aren't touching um <laughs> <laughs> i mean however someone wants to identify i'm not going to gatekeep people or or try to define other people's sexuality but just generally i find that entire concept a bit confusing yes it is confusing <laughs> so, <laughs> so 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 you're not you're not alone there Gepwin. so uh yeah <laughs> And it's kind of nice to know that other people are having that experience. It is such a, an odd thing where it's there, there's a, a, a sort of a cultural stigma, you know, you know, you know, uh, still against being gay or bi. And it's like we want to be able to be gay or bi, but not have that cultural stigma. And well, maybe the problem is that cultural stigma. Yeah. yeah maybe we should get rid of that instead of, you know, being weird and confusing. <laughs> Though from some yeah. other stuff that I have been reading, and I think it comes into this movie too, like the the I don't know if you could really get rid of the stigma exactly without a very fundamental shift in the society, because a lot of uh, queer theory has been kind of going towards this idea, especially politically, like uh, intersecting with feminism and a lot of other complicated political stuff I'm not going to go fully into. But the there's, there's a lot of basic idea that um, being LGBT is kind of not compatible with a lot of modern society at all. Like a lot of our ideas and values that we've kept being pushed into in modern society are so attached to heteronormativity and monosexism and uh, the gender binary that gets too challenged by the existence of the LGBT community at all. And that is one of the reasons that it's been that, like, the idea of just getting rid of the stigma or just finding acceptance within the existing social structure is not only very difficult it could be downright impossible without such a massive societal shift that things would basically be unrecognizable after the fact that uh, in order to really you know to have there not be this sort of baseline uh sort of uh you know even unintentional bigotry uh you know you're going to basically have to upend society change the rules uh shift you know things up and down you know like, like even just general dress codes and things like that you know are forced in a lot of businesses schools and etc you know would have to kind of be tossed out the window or completely reimagined uh in order to be at least re even reasonably in tune with you know what's needed yeah i mean you can see it in the this massive 
goddamned trans pushback that we're having right now. Mm -hmm. All of the horrible laws that are being enacted and the ways that people are being being kicked out of schools and prohibited from various activities. We've we've based so much of our society on the idea that the gender binary is the basis of a hierarchical system that puts men above women in a way that a lot of people very firmly believe. And if trans and non-binary people and other people in a gender spectrum exist in that context, it challenges the immutability of your gender binary system that you have based an entire hierarchy around. If someone can be outside that you know, established hierarchy, how does the hierarchy respond to it? Incorporating you know, you know, you know, non-binary folks and you know, trans folks would be difficult, so instead it tries to reject them entirely. Yeah, and you get into some things. You can see uh, I'm, I'm not trying to speak on to like, any, kind of, any kind of judging of who has it worse or better. That's kind of a really stupid fool's errand to go on. Yeah, oppression, uh, uh, you know, uh, competition thing you know, is, is counterproductive to uh, yeah. you know, solving problems. But you can kind of see this cultural idea where uh, binary trans people can, in fact, find places in society to some extent. Like, there's a mass amount of pushback, but there is some progress being made. Mm -hmm. And but only so far as in society is willing to fold them back into the existing system. You can go like, yeah, of course, this person is a woman, has always been a woman, and so can fit into the existing gender binary system as woman, as long as they're willing to appropriately, you know, convey themselves as a woman. To perform uh, properly. Yeah. Someone who doesn't want to be on either end of that spectrum, we don't really know what to do with. Or someone who is a woman but doesn't want to present fully as a woman, we don't know what to do with because they don't fit back neatly into the same hierarchy. So either reject them, exclude them, or, well, even hor more horrible things, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I've even been reading some stuff on how that even ties in to, like, biphobia and homophobia because the idea of being attracted to, like, like, see, with monosexual people who can be who are attracted to one gender or the other, you can also kind of fold that back in. Like for a while, there was a mass amount of pushback on that. We're getting more acceptance of gay and lesbian people now because they yeah. can fold that back in. It's the same thing, just the opposite. But uh, when yeah, you, you results may vary depending on location, though. Yes, a bit, <laughs> quite a bit. But when you talk about something like bisexuality or pansexuality, I'm going to keep using bisexuality as the broad I umbrella term because it's easier for me as an older person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, uh, I think there's a that meme out there that you know, uh, you know, for some folks, you know, bi and pan are basically the same thing, but for other folks, the difference does matter. Um, but uh, we'll just be sort of chill and say that we're kind of weird so we're, we're gonna kind of probably use yeah. ban more uh, buy more often sorry yeah i'm on tumblr but i wasn't raised on tumblr yes yeah. so i've been I've, like some of the reading i've been doing has kind of called out the idea that um being able to be attracted to more than one gender or being attracted to people regardless of the concept of gender at all also calls the hierarchy into question in a way that's very difficult to fold back in which is one of the reasons that you wind up with so much of the bi erasure problem of mm -hmm. you are just identified as whoever you happen to be with at the time. I've known uh, bi folks who are uh, dating opposite genders or the same genders, and that doesn't change them what, what they're all about there. So, you know, f folks out there, uh, please be mindful of that. And then you also wind up with that kind of issue, which they, they didn't touch on it in this movie a lot. A lot of the stuff that they talk about in the movie when I've been researching and looking up uh people doing analyses and things they talk about sexual fluidity mm -hmm. which i'm unclear on whether they're trying to draw a distinction between sexual fluidity and bisexuality but well, there's there's also sexual fluidity as in you know what you know what gender you identify with as well so yeah so i guess they're kind of lumping all that together into the exploration of the movie maybe we can come with a, a, su a super fluid <laughs> Maybe later, Bose Einstein gender, but uh, never mind. <laughs> yeah, is that the end? Is that the ending when they're all in the pool having? A... 
Well, it was apparently very cold on set, uh, so far, uh, much so that they're like, all right, you get, if you guys make it a really good take, then we only have to do it uh, a minimal amount of times, and then you can go warm up. So uh, <laughs> make it good, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. They didn't even have a heated pool. No. Uh, and uh, Susan Sarandon actually got pneumonia from it. Oof. Ouch. Yeah. Thing actors do. We don't drop many F-bombs on here, but I'm not sure how else to sort of describe it. But uh, gender fuckery going on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've seen that uh, term used in a number of ways, uh, but uh, usually it means attraction. Uh, we're going to have some attraction. It's the details don't really matter. Uh, as for what we are, eh, whatever. Also, we're going to do some stuff that's kind of like not sex, but also kind of sex, but. You know, like like even the elbow sex stuff. It's very much a sign of, of affection going on between uh, Riff Raff and Magenta. Um, but we don't really know what it means, but it's sort of symbolic at the same time. Yeah, well, they are called out as siblings. Yes. So one hopes yes, that are. it's a sign of affection. <laughs> well, they also make out at one point, you know, so, you know. It's like, well, <laughs> this is an incredibly bisexual movie, like... I think that it's an interesting one because it's such a just general exploration of sexuality and gender overall. Mm -hmm. Like Frank himself is a very, very interesting character while wearing female clothes through basically the entire film or at least female coded clothes. Like I haven't seen a woman wear many of these things outside of this movie. Um, I have, but, <laughs> you know, going to Rocky myself. So, <laughs> yeah, which is connected. So, but also Tim Curry is unashamedly powerfully masculine yes so there's some uh, a really intense combination going on here that's kind of glorious uh and it sort of draws the the mind into sort of multiple directions simultaneously and that's it just works <laughs> yeah i think it's nice to be able to just accept the character like the movie is very good at making you just accept the character, especially presenting everything as weird and slightly off-putting, giving you the point of view of the two people who don't really know what's going on. In a lot of other contexts, the kind of what are you question would be coming up a lot because someone who has not done much to change their appearance away from masculinity, but is also wearing high heels and lingerie, you you would wind up in a what is going on kind of question. But this movie puts it in a context where what is going on with Frank is kind of the least of your concerns. When Frank's uh, first coming down that elevator there, Brad's kind of being doing his asshole thing. You know, it's like, oh, these so hunting lodge for rich, weir rich weirdos. And, you know, we're, you know we're, this is all sorts of terrible stuff going on here. And then suddenly Frank's here and we're like, all right, well, I guess it's just one more thing then. And I honestly had to, uh, I'm a little all over the place because there's just so much. I think that's one of the things that makes this movie so intriguing is there's so much in it. There's so many mm -hmm. layers of things. I honestly had to look up some of the some of the things to make sure whether or not what I was reading as gay references were actually gay references. The, I like the, 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 the handles on the machine. Yeah, didn't put in the uh, the uh, the synopsis script, but I think one of the callbacks that's uh, sometimes used is uh, to to call the handles uh, dildos. So <laughs> since they only really showed up near the beginning, you can kind of forget about the bikers mm -hmm. and the entire subset of biker leather man culture that is in LGBT circles, especially from this time period, like around the the mid seventies, leather bars and things like that. And uh, you know uh, the uh, the the uh, uh, Palford, uh, the uh, the fellow uh, uh, the front man for uh, Judas Priest, uh, you know, started you know dre dressing in you know intense leather, and then you know later people were like, oh yeah, he's gay. That's that's what's going on. Well, that itself was sort of a, a like take back of masculinity from mm -hmm. the you know stereotype, which we still have of the effeminate gay man yeah which in, in a lot of ways like in a lot of ways this movie is really playing with the idea of masculinity in a lot of interesting ways you have the mm -hmm. biker imagery which is very much a rejection of effeminate masculinity and you have frank who's dressing effeminately but is also incredibly masculine 
you have a character like Rocky who appears incredibly masculine, but actually doesn't act as flamboyantly masculine as, say, Frank does. Rocky is at some level a sort of a blank slate to a degree, uh, given that he's new to the world. But, uh, you know, also he's sort of just kind of being there. And, uh, you know, he doesn't really have any performance to be sort of giving here as far as, you know, uh, what his gender expression is. So, yeah, he's kind of like, I look masculine, but other than that, shrug. Yeah, since he's completely new to the world, just born, all Mm -hmm. that jazz. Just seven hours old and a beauty to behold. So, yeah, I could kind of rant about some random gender studies stuff I've been reading into this for quite a while. But I feel like I'm getting muddled and I don't want to take over the complete conversation. So that's a lot of what I was that I was thinking of with these things. Yeah, well, uh, I guess maybe it's time for me to talk a little bit about my own experience with Rocky. Uh, so the first time I'd ever gone uh, was a late high school uh, uh, sort of era there. Uh, at the time, I was playing lots of uh, tabletop RPGs with my friends. And uh, I was, you know, one of my friends, uh, Richard, uh, you know, was like, hey, do you want to go to Rocky with us? Uh, I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I had seen the uh, the film uh, once previously uh uh, though with a big chunk in the middle of it, you know, uh, missing. Uh, but uh, I've never been to Rocky before. Um, but, you know, they knew that, you know, I'm kind of you know, a bit shy at times. And they're like, all right, we'll sort of you know, keep you out of trouble as it were. And, uh, you know, it wasn't as wild and crazy as I was sort of expecting at first, but it was still pre- pretty, you know, intense. Um, and uh, I got to do the time warp with uh, everyone up at the front of the theater. And that was pretty cool. Uh, and uh, learn a lot of the callbacks and, uh, generally had a good time and you know and it was very i guess fun being sort of in a community where you know there was a a general sort of we're not going to sort of worry about it in general it being whatever you know our day-to-day lives our you know sexuality uh gender expression our work our school our parents our you know siblings our kids uh because you know there's people of all ages there uh and oh maybe not really young kids of course but (laughs) high school on up as i'll say uh but uh, it was sort of a it was a liberating experience and and so i i went a number of times you know after that uh and then later especially in grad school we you know i mentioned we had uh showings uh put on ourselves uh and you know i helped out with that and you know it's you know of course not in a full theater it's just in a house but it was you know still a we're going to have fun and we're going to have a blast and we're going to not be sort of brought down by you know the the, the constraints and you know annoying things in the world and uh you know the, the tune uh you know near the end uh you know rose tint my world there is kind of i guess the anthem for that sort of particular experience there that yeah there is a certain level of our experiences here are sort of letting us escape these things that are sort of uh bringing us down and so we might not have them forever but it is going to be making it easier for ourselves for a little bit here and that's kind of good enough you know and uh you know over time you know this is sort of a film that you know for myself as well as a lot of other people uh, has sort of allowed them to throw, uh, cast off some of that you know, controlling stuff from society in order to sort of introspect and try to figure out what themselves are about. Some folks come out completely, you know, uh, you know, cis and straight. Others much less so. And you know, it, it is a opportunity. It is a an experience that facilitates folks being able to find themselves. And I love that about this film. Uh, and what more, uh, the existence of Rocky playing weekly for years on end and people in the great society being sort of aware of that has actually kind of helped folks get more comfortable with you know, things beyond straight cis and I guess sort of the, 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 the pre-established uh, hierarchy there that there is this phenomenon out there that folks are enjoying and they're not hurting people they're just existing and maybe we should be okay with that and i think that's uh definitely helped uh you know 
push society forward at a, uh, you know, to a certain degree. It's not, you know, the major, you know, uh, factor there, but it is something that is contributed. And that's another thing I love about this film, that the whole cult following and, you know, the repeated viewings there and the whole culture that's built up around it has helped change the world for the better. For, uh, just a little bit, but it's there. And that does sound fun to have this, just these, any space where you can just be able to go you know what fuck it mm -hmm. just whatever goes even for a little while and not having to worry about it exactly like i can see that being a very helpful thing to get to yeah and not everybody has that opportunity but for those that have it's liberty liberating as well as a opportunity to find ourselves and i'd say it definitely helped me find myself a bit uh, there's other factors, of course, but, uh, you know, this is one of the earlier ones that uh, popped in. And, yeah, so thank you, Rocky Horror. All right, did you have anything else particular? Yeah, you know, I could also talk about Operation Paperclip. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Dr. Vaughn Scott, anyone? You anyone? know where I'm this? And, and, no. Uh, get, get, get one. <laughs> so, uh so it's sort of implied in the movie that uh, Dr. Scott, with his uh, kind of heavy German-esque accent, might have come from Germany uh, perhaps a few decades ago. Specifically, since this is clearly set in the 70s, that kind of implies he might have been uh, brought over uh, post-World War II. Uh, so Operation Paperclip, for those unaware, was sort of the name given to the overall effort as well as a few other things attached to it that weren't technically under it where the U S tried to basically acquire uh, German scientists from uh, Nazi Germany. So the, basically the Russians didn't get them, uh, but also to, uh, you know, make use of their expertise here in the United States. Uh, and so they would go and re uh, do re uh, recruits, uh, recruitings, uh, you know, in Germany specifically, as well as basically almost kidnap them at times. Um, but there was also a, you know, especially near, uh, in the immediately right at the end of the war, they're like, okay, so we're going to be uh, kind of bringing you over to the U.S. or somewhere else because we don't want the Soviets to come. And, well, this area is going to be under their control very soon. So uh, tell us how many family members you're bringing, but meet in the, t in the, in the town square at this time. And we'll have a bus to take you to the train station. Uh, you're uh, good to go. Good. Yeah, that's how we wound up with von Braun and all those rocket engineers and yes, other uh, such rocket people. engineers and uh, chemists, uh, even an architecture or two, uh, material scientists, uh, physicists, medicines, you know, doc, you know, medical doctor sort of uh, experts there uh, in research and actual performance, I guess. Uh, and uh, you know the and and so a, a massive amount of uh, expertise was basically imported, uh, and how involved these folks were with the whole Nazi thing was kind of just pushed under the rug. Uh, the uh, you know the paperclip sort of refer you know was you know I, I don't know if it's uh, how much truth there was to it, but it's sort of the idea that you know if you got this paperclip here, then that means you know, just kind of ignore some of the more problematic things, and we'll just sort of have them be over here and don't worry about it. Uh, but then. You know, a number of times since then, uh, you know, occasionally it's like, oh, yeah, this uh, one scientist uh, that we have this award named after. Uh, yeah, they kind of made use of forced labor in Nazi Germany. So that's kind of not cool. Maybe we should discontinue the award. Yeah. They're, yeah. 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 The implication that Dr. Scott is, uh, you know, uh, you know, one of these folks is uh, quiet, but it was sort of one of those things that was kind of entering the public consciousness uh, in the years, uh, you know, you know, after the, the the war there, and so you get sort of the situation where there's potentially a whole number of uh, Nazi scientists who may have been up to some really kind of crap things that just kind of never were held, uh, you know, you know, responsible for their actions, which kind of sucks. Well, that's very interesting having him as one the rival scientist to Frankenfurter to he is often cited in in analyses and things of this as the one of the one of the characters that still upholds heteronormativity mm -hmm. and also well i kind of did miss that with 
with the doctor at the end coming in because I wasn't paying as much attention to the symbolism by that point since it was my first viewing. Some of the symbolism at the beginning is uh, very directly referencing Nazi concentration camps. The uh, the red triangle that Frank has on his lab coat was a way that gay people were identified in uh, Nazi prisons. The one that folks most uh, familiar with, of course, uh, the Jewish star, but... You know, if uh, someone was not straight, then they would get the pink triangle. It's a symbol that's been sort of, uh, I guess, taken back to a degree, uh, though it isn't as, I guess, in common usage these days, but sometimes it is. Yeah, it was uh, at some points reclaimed. It's it's kind of in niche places right now. And uh, there's been some debate around it, as I understand. I'm not completely familiar with all the discourse in this area. Yeah, same here, so. But I hadn't brought that together, that there is that imagery near the beginning and then bringing this guy in with possibly the, you know, Nazi scientist angle is a very interesting part of the film that I didn't catch on. It's a, sort of a, a subtle underlying bit there, but it is uh, it is there. So uh, but even ha having uh, Scott near the end sort of giving in to his, uh, you know, uh, you know, inner needs there uh, is kind of interesting that even this guy who's the uh sort of the the last holdout uh is going to give in eventually uh you know you know once he sort of has has enough exposure and opportunity to sort of realize oh maybe this isn't so bad you know <laughs> yeah so he can both be the last holdout and the representation that this will eventually win out yes <laughs> so uh so uh, uh nazi assholes uh you're going to lose, just just so you know. Nice. That's a good ending. <laughs> I like that ending. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, hooray. That's kind of uh, most of the stuff I had. Uh, mm. I guess I could talk a little more about my own experiences, but it would be mostly talking about uh, that uh, time I uh, dated a gal named uh, Tina. But, you know, I'm not sure how we want, want to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Nazis losing is a better place than we normally get to at the end of at the end of stories with our yes. with our bent. <laughs> <laughs> unless we want to get into colonialism again but <laughs> now nah, colonialism is also going to lose yeah yeah eventually <laughs> all right so in that case it's probably just time for the galaxy's favorite game show Hey everybody, welcome to the galaxy's favorite game show. We got various contestants here and they're all so lovely. Hmm, how are you doing, Gabwin? I'm doing fine. Excellent. Are you ready to hand out some prizes? Yeah, we're being very mellow and it's kind of relaxing now. Yes, usually I have my overly excited announcer voice, but uh, not this time. <laughs> Our first prize today is Too Weird to Die, which goes to Rocky for apparently being resistant to antimatter somehow. What does he win, Gepwin? Rocky wins that sword he keeps talking about because this could be the best, most flamboyant, most golden boxer shorts wearing Conan the Barbarian series ever. Oh, that would be lovely. Yes. Our second prize is are we the guest stars, which goes to Brad and Janet, because whatever they've wandered into seems to have been uh, the culmination of something. And, you know, at times it's barely their story at all, but at other times it's a bit focused on them, yes. What do they win, Gepwin? Brad and Janet win a fall expense trip to some 70s LGBT commune that I'm sure was they could find somewhere, because they obviously don't want to go back to heteronormativity or possibly monogamy at all after this and they can continue to be side characters yes and uh yeah, perhaps they can leave denton behind or wherever it was they're going hmm. i think the map said they were southeast ohio i don't think there's any communes there unless maybe at the U uh, ohio university anyway a third prize is the Berserker Button Prize, which goes to Frankie for getting all super jealous anytime Rocky is at least 
any way close to anyone else. Just generally. What does he win, Gedwin? Frankie wins a lot of weed. I feel like it fits his character, and he really needs to calm down. Uh, there's a uh, callback in uh, you know that last bit uh, you know where he's going home. Uh, the uh, the callback is instead of "I'm going home," is "I'm fucking stoned." <laughs> Our next prize is the heteronormative dystopia, which goes to the real world, of which this film is kind of a response to. What does the real world win, Gepwin? The real world wins a lot of fire in which to burn itself to the ground. Hmm. Hopefully it's uh, aptly applied to the right places and at the right times. So I don't want to be burning myself down, you know. Our next prize is the show within a show prize, which goes to the whole cast for that floor show at the end. What do they win, Gepwin? They win a Tony within a Tony, because... Now, one of these iterations of this movie show something deserved an award. I'd have to agree. And also, yo dog, I hear you like Tony's. <laughs> Our last prize is the Let's Forget This Ever Happened prize, which goes to the criminologist because he just doesn't get it. What does he win, Gepwin? Criminologist wins a research grant to write a very stodgy book about all of his theories around this that no one will ever read and will wind up in a second-hand shop where someone will read about the UFO castle and start a whole other conspiracy cult. Hmm. Well, I'd prefer uh, UFO conspiracy cults uh, uh, to other sorts of uh, conspiracy nonsense, honestly. So I think that's a, a good result there. And that's all, all the prizes we got today. I hope you... Listeners have a lovely time. Take us away, Gepwin. <laughs> yes, thank you all for being here and joining us on the most mellow version of the galaxy's favorite game show. You did not give me a good way to transition into the yelling. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, this is our palate cleanser before we, uh, <laughs> you know, we, uh, get back to, you know, uh, you know, more Star Trek and things like that. So changing things up for at least a little bit, I uh, think was a, a good way to roll it here. Um, also, uh, before I forget, uh, Rocky, because uh, you brought up sort of Damocles there. The, the actor didn't actually sing any of his bits there, at least Ten. as far as the, the, the film goes here. He was actually dubbed over uh, so because <laughs> uh, apparently he wasn't much of a singer. Right? <laughs> I actually, just as a complete aside, completely didn't get any of the Charles Atlas references in the All Make a Man song in regards to Rocky, which... I feel bad about because he lived in Brooklyn for a long time, and I am, in fact, surrounded by statues of the dude. You, you could experience Charles Atlas without having to build yourself a creature, then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't get any of the references in that song. I had to look back at his Wikipedia page to get any of his, any of his things. I'd never heard of this dude. I live a 20-minute walk away from a statue that he modeled for. Yeah, it was, you know, if I recall, he was all about uh, bodybuilding and, you know, we'll uh, help you become a bodybuilder, too, and become you know, big and beautiful and all that sort of stuff. Yep. Ten uh, steps to a better body. <laughs> and uh, I think the, uh, the the tag for I'll make you a man is actually from one of his advertisements for that. So, yep. It's all so anyway. a, lot of, a lot of specific references there. Which, yeah. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, look up Charles Atlas because it's very interesting. Very interesting, all the cultural stuff that came from this. It's also kind of, you know, it's kind of a cool name for that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I am Atlas. Uh, Charles Atlas, actually. <laughs> so uh, next time uh, we're going to be uh, sort of doing our intro to uh, some more Star Trek, right? Yeah, next time we are back. We're back to Star Trek with another another group of people who were possibly kids when the original series was happening. Well, Patrick Stewart's like a bazillion years old. He, you know, he was probably already like 80 at that time. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be interesting to look back because let's see, like 
I think they reference that McCoy is 90 something or possibly 110 actually. I think McCoy is like in his 110s in the pilot. And I'm not sure how old McCoy was supposed to be at the end of the last movie. Yeah. Somebody knows uh, how long it was between these things. Now, remind me and I can look this stuff up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, we are going back to Star Trek with Next Generation, the one that I grew up with. Yeah, so we're, we're going to be doing a uh, uh, sort of an intro summary sort of thing first, correct? Yeah, we should, well, just like same as same as last time. Anyone who listened to our first episode, it wasn't actually an episode. It was a intro to the very concept of Star Trek as a thing. So, yes. yeah, we'll we'll do an episode that's all the history set up, introduce characters, etc. Because I do not want to have to read the cast list every single time. Yes. <laughs> well, so we could focus on the guest characters and things like that. Yeah, so we'll do an episode that's basically that, the cast list for the whole thing. And you know, <laughs> you know I, just I, reali- I just realized I, going from... Sorry, you go. <laughs> you know, I, have did, I did a, a, a humorous uh, version of the cast list uh, when we did uh, Insurrection, but uh, we'll do a little bit more serious one for this one. <laughs> yeah. And I was just realizing... So we, we started with Original Series, which um, <laughs> is a fairly unintentionally gay show, mm-hmm. or bi show, depending on who you ask. Uh, then we meandered around for a bit. We've done more or less things. Then we hit this, which is probably the gayest thing that we have done. Yes. With Rocky Horror. Now we're taking a step down because even though you can read some stuff into here, Next Generation is possibly the least gay of the Star Treks. Even though it's the one I like most, I would argue that it might be the least gay. I'd say so. Uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, you know, there there might be something between uh, uh, Data and uh, Picard, but you know it's never materialized. So yeah, like through all the things, this is probably the one with the least vibes. Yeah, because it uh, is unfortunate. Yeah, I, I'm doing a little bit of a rewatch of uh, DS9, and I just got past the other day uh, the episode where you know Brian's like, yeah, I wish uh, Keiko was more like you, Bashir. Uh, <laughs> you know. And Bashir's like, oh, you mean like a man? So, so yeah, you know, the, you know, TNG, not super gay, um, but we'll we'll touch on things as they come up, I guess. We will, yeah. Unfortunately, as we'll get into with the you know history of the show next time, not for lack of trying. So I know this one's probably been a bit on the longer side, but I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, Rocky and uh, we'll enjoy uh, some TNG talk uh, next time. Yeah, and join us next time for our little intro romp before we hit the actual episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Watchers of Tomorrow, The Next Generation. You have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcast, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more. And where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and More is Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs>